What makes me fearless is that my fear is not going to stop me. When you're really confident, it's almost like you don't think. Hi everyone, welcome back to Think About It with me, Victoria Zarenka. It was a pleasure to speak with Dr. Raul Jandial. Dr. Raul is a neurosurgeon, a neuroscientist, and a best-selling author. From the inception of the show, I knew I wanted to talk to a brain surgeon, so I was really excited about this one. Our conversation is full of take-home advice on how you can boost your brain and improve your cognitive performance, and I think you're really going to love it. Thank you so much for joining my show. I am really, really excited for, for our talk. I wanted to ask you, how do you feel after so many years of, of practicing medicine? Because I know there's also people who just do research and then don't necessarily yeah. doctors that, that do practice. So how much of a student do you feel um, to this day, when you, especially when you also travel to different places? Yeah, that's an insightful question because... You know, surgery can get you much, you know, surgeons and athletes, I think there's a big overlap. Whereas law, it may be irrelevant when you leave this country. Surgical skill is relevant internationally. We still call the instruments by the same name. We don't actually have to speak the language, but the words we use to describe the anatomy are similar. And then there's also the element of travel where you see people fighting the good fight, taking care of patients who don't have resources. And they do it for the love of the game, if you will, love of the art and the craft. Mm -hmm. And so to me, travel and seeing surgeons in other countries, uh, such as Ukraine or Bolivia or Peru, it really lets me see my life in a new light. And that's the best education to realize how good I have it here. I mean, some of the things in the operating room that we ask for, and some surgeons get irritable if they don't have, mm -hmm. they, they wouldn't even go in that direction in the other countries. I mean, I've seen them work with tools that are 10% of what we have mm -hmm. and, and they care for the, the instruments like their children. They come out in these in cloth that's tended to. So it just makes you look differently at the privilege I have here uh, where my tools are better than the tools of equal and sometimes even greater surgeons in other countries. So I guess for you as an athlete, it would be, like watching people from other country not having the proper shoes or the gear or the training and still competing and maybe even outperforming. So for me, it's a, it's, I have tremendous respect for people in other countries who do it under trying circumstances. Yeah, I have, I have seen many times some of the videos of like little kids that they're playing, you know, on the side of the street and they have no shoes. Their racket is like, you know, it's not even a racket, but the emotion that comes with those videos are so pure and so happy that when you look at yourself sometimes it's like okay well i have the best rackets in the world i have the best equipment in the world and sometimes i can't that get that happy so it is it is all about what's within you and how you see things and how what perspective do you do you, do you have do you have on life and when i remember myself because i grew up also not I didn't grow up privileged I remember actually when I wanted to play ping pong and we didn't have any rackets so we used the uh, like a uh, plastic cards uh, plastic boxes of rec uh, record strings we would find it like in the trash cans and we would play with them and we had the best time so every time I remember those stories when you know I feel a certain way that kind of helps me to to remember the the joy of like simple things that 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 that, that you have uh in life I love that and my I have three sons they're 14 15 and 19 now the 19 year old six one and and I remember when they were growing up I used to say like let's let's try to hit the ball Ten, you know, baseball with yeah. like a stick or a broom handle because in other parts of the world, that's how they train. Yeah. So they get the timing down with tools that are subpar. Yeah. I think it's a great way to develop skills. So when I started operating in other countries, when I would come back to the States, um, I needed less of the tools here in our modern operating rooms. And when things would go wrong or I'd have to navigate a difficult case, mm -hmm. having done it with limited resources and tools actually fortified me, gave me a certain confidence. So 
you know, for you, it's joy. For me, it's that, that flow, that experience that comes from, from performing under pressure. I love that. That's meditation for me is where you focus, but not, and not distracted. And there, that's a unique feeling. I think performers get, whether it's rock stars or athletes. And I think complex surgery is also something like that. It's a release of maneuvers. It's not a checklist of going through like repairing an engine with 150 steps. No, there's a lot of uh, flexibility and uh, creativity when you're performing. And I love that. I always, I, mean, I always tell people I couldn't be an athlete or a rock star, so I had to settle for being a surgeon. <laughs> well, I think what, what, you, what you do is a bit more important than, than uh, for, for people's lives than what, uh, what we do. When you talk about you know, doing brain surgery, to me, it would be like, oh my God, like I'm in charge of somebody's life. So it's, it's, a, it's not a playing a tennis match. Like I play a tennis match and I lose. I mean, that's okay. Uh, whatever happens. But here you kind of cannot lose. Like there is no, there is no, uh, that's a different type of responsibility, especially having responsibility over somebody rather than yourself. But my question is like, in terms of how your brain uh, perceives that information, does that feel like, difference or it's still kind of in the same focus and the same uh, reaction to it? From my understanding and my reading, performance, you have to tease it out. Um, it's an intellectual performance, like a chess match. I think creativity and performance get put into the same buckets when there's physical performance, yeah. where there's intellectual performance, there's performance under pressure that's mm -hmm. physical or intellectual. There's just a lot of layers. And what I like about surgery and sports and, and some, some people who do things like pilot airplanes under pressure is that it, it's, it's sort of the, the space between physical performance and intellectual performance. You can't be all hands and you can't be all smarts. It, it's something in between. And for me, what I add on top of that is an element of risk. Now, my life is not at risk, but my patience is. Mm -hmm. And I think that for, for me, that brings me to the moment. I always joke, joke that if I was a pediatrician, I'd be horrible. I'd be like, oh, kid's got a cough. I'd just be negligent almost in my attention. But when it's me that's responsible, when I meet somebody and they're talking to me much like yourself and I say, okay, now I'm going to put you under anesthesia next week and open your skull and perform surgery and get you through that, there's ownership with it. There's risk with it. For me, that brings out my attention. Mm -hmm. And... There's two things going on in the mind. There's attention, but there can be too much attention. That's stress and anxiety. You're just too dialed in. You're thinking about it too much. For me, so the attention has to be there, but not too much. And a lot of people think, you know, that, that it's some special focus. But for somebody who's an elite athlete or an elite surgeon, the skill is actually not dialing up attention, but dialing down distractions. And so there's things your brain is putting out to do, but there's also the things coming in, oh, the lights are on, or this moment matters, or if I win, or if I perform well, my career will advance. Those distractions can actually put your attention in a spiral. So when you look at the brains of people who are performing well, they're less frenetic. They're less chaotic. They're actually using less energy because they're letting habits and rituals and well-developed skill release itself. Just like imagination and performance, it has to be released by trimming down the distractions. So I think that's a nuance that people forget or don't fully appreciate is it's not that elite performers have greater focus. Mm -hmm. It's they have greater ability to not notice distractions. That's a really good point because I always think when, when I perform and stuff, it's like, your body is active, but your mind is calm because if it goes the other, if if the if the uh, mind becomes active, your body becomes you know slower because it's it's functioning a bit, the like the system overload, right? And and and, you, and you're absolutely right with with distractions. It's a, some sort of you know what people talk about doing meditation and what what do you think about? I've been asked that recently about my tennis match. Like when you do your meditation, what do you think about? It's like absolutely nothing. That's the whole point. The whole point is to be able to just be clear 
and and have the moment of of quiet because we're always running through things and we're imagining things with if i if i'll make an analogy on tennis where you overthink a shot and you have one shot and then all of a sudden you 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 thought about one option i'm gonna do this and then oh maybe i can do another one make it do another one and then you have two three options and then you're you're miss and then you miss for sure so so it's just that that particular moment of i was i think it's a, it's a simpler way for somebody who knows how to block out distractions, but for people who maybe just starting to practice that that exercise is the focus on just one simple objective, right? So that's so then it's ultimately blocks out the distractions, but sometimes it's hard to 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 explain. And I I would love for people to to like who listens like to try maybe to understand that little exercise that that can happen and that you can do. And uh, I've watched one of your interviews where you talked about brain training, right? And when we talk, when I hear about brain training in terms of a global message, a lot of times that applies to athletes, right? Because that's where you want to elevate your performance, where you want to gain that little advantage of, um, you know, for yourself. But it doesn't always talks about brain training as for your daily life, right? And um, one of the things that was really interesting for me to hear is what you explained about uh, just try to do something with left hand, for example, if you're a right-handed person, try to do to activate certain cells that maybe you, obviously you have them, but they are sleeping and they're not activated. So can you maybe? walk me a little bit more through on on the importance of brain training for everybody and especially what's i think one of the very interesting point for me is for kids um how how important that is because i have a son you you're obviously a parent too but something that i want to learn for you know how i can help my my son because where i came from that was not really a case of you know developing your brain through training it was more about doing this and that just work hard and everything (laughs) might might happen or may not happen but just 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 to educate myself and also like people who are going to be listening of of the importance of uh that those exercises let's break that into two things though there's what we were talking about early elite performance Mm -hmm. Elite performance always begins with elite skill. So there's no way to skip that step. It's like people ask me about creativity. Well, you got to, before you connect all the dots, you got to know all the dots. So if we leave that here and we think about, okay, brain training, cultivating uh, your brain, which can get you towards elite performance if you can release it under pressure. But if we back up and say brain training, I think, what we're missing is an understanding of what's what's the design in here there is a design yeah and then there's something above the design but there is a structure there are connections there's a biology there's a chemistry and there's electricity in there and what i always tell people is i want to get away i've fallen in that trap i want to get away from wiring we're just using wiring we're wired for this we're hardwired for this because we're in the age of computers. Decades ago, they thought there were gears in there when machines were more dominant, right? So the true way to think of the brain comes from how neuroscientists have been writing about the brain for decades in our journals, and is to think of it as a garden or an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And to begin with, you are born with more seeds and more plants than you hold on to. So our children at age one had more brain cells than they do when they become teenagers or adults. That's not a bad thing. So you're you're born equipped with a lot of potential. It's a crude potential. It's not finely developed. And you can see that as they learn to walk and talk, that means things are happening. Use it or lose it is a, you know, sort of a casual way to think about it. But the brain is an ecosystem. It's a garden that has to be cultivated. You cultivate it by learning things. You cultivate it by experiences. And you cultivate it by taking on challenges that you usually don't. That's where using the left hand, learning a new language. I always tell people, you don't actually have to learn the language. You just have to try to learn the language. 
-hmm. You don't have, have to actually learn how to play the instrument, but the process of learning will cultivate more of that neuronal garden. Mm -hmm. And then when you have that lush garden that you built up, it's there for you when you get older as it starts to wither. So in the later stages of life, it could prevent dementia. That is one way to think about it is building that cognitive reserve. But the broader, the broader and the more lush and the more detailed your garden is, if you do gymnastics for all kids at age four, or if you learn multiple languages, if you learn a musical instrument to coordinate your hand and your thinking, you're for your, not compared to somebody else, but for your former self that didn't do that, you're in a better position to be an elite athlete. You're in a better position to be an elite surgeon. You become more equipped with that ability. And that's what brain training does. It's a habit. We're always talking about cosmetic stuff. Why not an element of cultivating all those neurons with that lush environment that's inside our mind. We develop so much like called baggage, right? That that you hold on to and you kind of can can't let go of that. So how how does that in terms of like brain cells, how does that help to, I don't know, um, maybe slower slow down the process of of development or something because you hold on to something and you yeah. don't necessarily make the room for for something else. And so, so that was the kind of interesting part for me to understand. So in the beginning, we were talking about like the structure and the flesh of the brain, mm -hmm. but the way it communicates, the way that garden communicates is more like a cluster, of, a giant cluster of jellyfish. Electricity sparks through that electric garden. Mm -hmm. So the design under a microscope is a garden branching neurons that are connecting with each other. But if you look at how they talk to each other, those branches, they don't touch, they stop and they release chemicals like dopamine or serotonin, things we've become familiar with. Mm -hmm. And the, the neurons, they run with electricity. So there's electricity inside our skulls. It's measurable. Mm -hmm. And that electricity is the thoughts. So you have to go from a garden but the flows through it aren't like wires. It's not left and right. It's like the way a school of, you know, a flock of birds or a school of fish or aurora borealis. There's energy flows through that electric garden. And so thoughts and habits are energy flows that get stuck in a rut. Mm -hmm. Much like a ski slope where you're always taking, you know, there's a preferential way to get down from the mountain top. Bad habits, traumatic experiences, the energy wants to run in a certain direction, despite your effort, the trauma of your youth or the struggles you've had or the bad experience on the court, it almost becomes easier for it to slither down that way. Mm -hmm. And so in the beginning to change those habits, it takes work. You have to sort of create a new desire or preference for those energy flows in your mind. And that's where counseling, talking, psychological therapy, all those things, are a way for you to change the direction of the electricity in your mind. So that's where it takes effort in the beginning, but it's not a lifelong effort. Yeah. That's where people can heal from trauma. That's where people can get over a bad sporting experience or a, a difficult case in the operating room. So it's not permanent, but it does take effort in the beginning to redirect the energy and the thoughts in your mind. Yeah, and it's and it's just like anything else physical that you do when you recover from physical injury. You know, the first is is a smaller step where you get tired after five minutes, then you get tired after ten minutes, and then and then it kind of uh, goes on from there. But um, what I wanted to ask you about the stress uh, trauma recovery, uh, maybe something about the research of how um, what part of brain does like activate most when you have a, a traumatic experience? Because I know when they do um, like the CT scan of the brain for, for research, there's always like the one part that start, start flashing a bit more than others. And so I wanted to learn a bit more of that. Me personally, not the field I'm in, I'm trying to move away from you even using the word brain scans are very important. We've learned a lot from it, but it gives it a sense of computers and wiring and what I would say is, if you look at other mammals, they don't have these foreheads that we have. Mm -hmm. And that's because the, the prefrontal cortex, just think of it as the ridges on the surface where, you're, where most of the thought and most of the creativity and most of the um, 
intellectual activity happens. It blossoms so quickly that to fit into our skulls, it had to be folded like an accordion. That's why you have those ridges when you think of the iconic, enigmatic structure of the brain. And it pushed, literally pushed our foreheads forward, remodeled the skull so it could fit inside. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how we usually think of the brain. Deeper inside, which all mammals have, many mammals have actually, mm -hmm. is the visceral brain. And that's where you have these things where you don't want to think if you're by the edge of a cliff. You don't want to think if you're by a poisonous animal. You react. You have an instinct. Yep. So when you have trauma, the trauma goes to those areas. And they've given names to them, amygdala, different things like that. But I call it the emotional brain or the visceral brain. So that's there for you to be quick, to avoid dangers, to survive, right? But it's also there where you get imprinted too deeply if you have a traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. And so how to move past that is, again, to engage this, this ecosystem, this this intersection of the emotional brain and the thinking cognitive modern brain. Yeah. And through revisiting it in a controlled environment, through having a therapist or a counselor, you can start to say to yourself, listen, that's not a real snake. That's a rubber snake. You don't have to jump every time. So you know you have the ability, right? You don't, you don't get fooled by a trick spider if you have fear of spiders or snakes over and over again, right? Something happens, you tell yourself, hey, don't, don't, don't listen to that emotion. Don't let that reaction set in too deep. So you know that interplay exists. Now, can you apply that to, hey, if you were hurt in, in an alley or if you were hurt in a certain place in the world or at a certain time of day, you want to be reactive in the beginning. You just don't want to be reactive years later. And that process can be thought down, but it does take effort. The possibility is there. That's just what I want people to know, that it can be done. Your, your traumatic experiences can be put behind you. I read a lot about like emotional, you have emotional pain that triggers physical pain. And it's, it's very interesting to understand that sometimes you feel pain, but you don't know where it's coming from. And, and I had those also with some of the injuries, you know, sometimes you, you get injured in sport and it may be related to completely different, uh, topic than the actual sport that you're doing. And so what is your view on like emotional emotional pain that brings later on for for a physical sometimes like really critical physical abilities yeah that's also these are first of all brilliant questions <laughs> and and the thing about the dna i mean the word is great now it's you know it's the dna of our corporations the dna it's just thrown around a lot yeah. dna is not our destiny it's just a certain direction where the compass and the ship is pointing, but through your experiences, right? When they say nature and nurture, you know, nature being DNA, nurture really should be experiences. So just because you're born with a, a certain genetic profile doesn't mean that's how you're going to end up physically, intellectually, emotionally. Your experiences, your choices can guide what part of that DNA is read. It's like a cookbook. Every, every cell has the entire cookbook, essentially, not every cell, but almost all. And so which recipe you make determines whether you become a brain cell or a heart cell. So there's a lot of plasticity is a simple word for it, but there's a lot of flexibility in your fate. And I think that's first, that's again, that's to me, that's a empowering concept. Definitely. And I feel like people in general react best to an example. You know, it's, it's very... Uh, I, I've noticed it's very hard for people to just listen and then be like, they're motivated for a day or two, right? Then it's like, yeah, well, I'm going to do that. But then that's just everyday practice that you, you kind of have, have to do. But when you, when you see an example, and I think the best way to show is probably uh, sports, because people weren't sure, oh, can I jump and I t can I touch the rim? Can I jump over six six uh, feet? Can I can I do this? Can I can I not do this? And once you see that that's possible, you know, people in Paralympics. I just watched the I just watched the documentary about the Paralympic athletes, and I was so inspired by this, like how amazing they are and what they can do with their resilience. How how is it? possible to kind of 
show people by an example of those things that your mental capacity, your brain capacity are capable of, but it's so invisible. And I feel like it comes in a little bit in both ways. You know, when you see someone with physical disability, you always feel like, oh, I, I feel, you know, emotionally uh, a certain way toward, towards that person, but they can go through this emotional hell, but you will never be able to tell. And so I just want people to kind of understand a little bit both sides um, of the good and, and the bad, the, the, the invisibility of, of that and how maybe with some conversations, maybe a, a little bit broader conversation, and more complex conversation that can be understood a bit better because it's not simple things. It's not like, oh, you know what? Just do this for 30 days and you'll, ha and, and you'll be that. That's, that's not how it works. It's just some things work for other people. So you're always in this experimental state where then you find something that works, but then you still, you're always searching. And that kind of brings me back to beginning of our conversation where, where I asked you, how do you feel you as a student, you know, in your own, in your own uh, profession, but in life, it's like w what it's kind of really is about is like always learning, always developing yourself. And in the conversation we start, is the brain training. So I think that's all those things are a part of that, that help you to develop, to learn a better skill, to become excellent in a certain um, field that, that, you, that you do. And it's, it's possible for, for everybody. And as you said, I hope that people understand that, that you are not designed for one thing, even genetically, you're not designed for one thing. You're able to develop all those, you know, skills and tools to help you to grow and you know we people say you always have limitations and i don't necessarily think of those things as limitations is just your ability of how far you are able to push yourself yeah cultivating the way i think about it is cultivating our interior lives mm -hmm. so brain training mind training actually is even higher than that and that's what I want people to take away, the possibility based on your anatomy, your chemistry and your electricity, all surging and flying through your brain and your skull. Like that should leave you empowered that no triumph is forever and no tragedy yeah. is forever, you know, and that we can be new every day by giving examples and explaining the design that the goal of that is not to give people a shortcut but let people know that it's possible yeah how far you take it is based on a lot of things it's based on who you are it's based on where you are in your life so i, I love the concept of mind training turning the attention inward really choosing whether these emotions have a right to be in your mind those are big challenges resilience is an interesting topic a lot of people think about it as like bouncing back that's the engineering discussion resilience from mind my my perspective on it is not just getting back to where you were but taking that challenge taking those difficult times and actually becoming more not better but more more fortified and in some ways inoculated from the pain that you have endured and survived so when the next struggle comes yeah. you have that memory of i've been through that i can get through that and so psychological resilience is a much bigger concept than uh engineering resilience but i i'm fascinated by those thoughts because i'm also trying to apply them to my life mm -hmm. um, to deal with my struggles and difficulties it hasn't been easy and, and um and it hasn't been necessarily hard it's been very individual my interior life and just from our conversation today my interior life is different and and talking with you has been has been a joy and i hope in 2021 we'll meet up for coffee in minsk i hope so i got a fun question for you yeah surgery is a two-handed sport yeah how, how come tennis you can't just always hit a forehand by switching the racket to your left or your right you know how can you do a backhand rather than just be ambidextrous and some baseball players swing 
lefty or righty. Has anybody done that or is that against the rules for tennis? No, it's not against the rules. They have some players, but they've never got to an elite level. And I think it's more about you would you would have to practice twice as more to develop, you know, that as a weapon twice. And there's quite more players who play the same backhand and backhand. So both sides, both, both hands. Um, and uh, in my case, for example, my backhand is better because I'm able to develop more, more speed with two hands and more power. And when I was a kid, and also especially when you're a kid, I was very skinny. I didn't really have much power. It was easier for me to hit with two hands. Um, so, but I never been taught to hit with two hands here because it also limits your reach where you can stretch out. So I think there's more like technicality like, like that. Uh, but what's interesting is, um, there's a lot of, uh, players who are lefty with their, they play lefty, but they write with right, for example, and, and do things with the right hand, which is something for like my son, I wanted to, to not experiment because then it's like, I mean, but like to teach him different things, because this is like, I wish I've, somebody have taught me because I would have had more skill and try all different sports because that's also one thing. I've played all different sports when I was a kid. So it developed me the coordination where I take something new now and it's easier for me to, to do it than, than something else. So I think that's, that's really cool. And, um, hopefully he will, he will follow my advice a bit until a certain age, he has no choice, but after that, <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be interesting i know what a pleasure to talk with you thank you so much i have last little segment that i do with all my guests and it's just to get to know you a little bit better it's very simple few questions there are literally one one kind of one word answers what is your favorite word nuance what is one profession that um Besides your own, you would love to to be able to do. Well, that's a good one. I've been I've been asked about this quite a few times about like what would you do, and so if I could, yeah, I'd like to be an NFL. If I if I had the ability and the training, I'd like to be an NFL quarterback. But more realistically, I think I would have uh, I think I would have been a good firefighter or a detective, something physical and out there. Okay, that's cool. And what is one profession you would never want to do? Lawyer. <laughs> For obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, okay. What is uh, what quality do does like uh, you admire from people? Authenticity, even if it's flawed. Okay. And what is one kind of uh, characteristic that turns you off? Hateful people. I think it's the shortcut to nuanced and authentic emotions. Just hate as a re response. I understand like if there are people who are animals, you might feel that you hate them. But I feel like the word hate and the way people are acting sometimes is just, it's such a simple and crude emotion. It lacks the nuance. So I don't, I don't, and it, it's too when I see people who've done well, they don't, sorry, it's too long of an answer. When I see people who've done well, it's, it's, they're never driven by hate and antagonism. It's, it's something that doesn't let people spiral upward, you know? That's true. Okay. And the last question, if you, if let's say God exists and you arrive at the pearly gates, what would you like the God to tell you? That I can, I can come in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> come on through. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, th those are all my questions. So thank you so much for what a what an amazing and insightful uh, conversation! I will have to read through it uh, and listen to it through it to kind of you know process all the information that I got. But it was such a such a pleasure, and I've learned a lot today. And uh, thank so thank you so much. The pleasure is all mine. You're an athlete and, and a scholar, so it's it's a nice mix. So I hope I get to see you somewhere, maybe in Minsk, maybe in LA at some point. But uh, yeah, definitely we'll, we'll be in touch. Sounds good. What a pleasure. Thank you again for including me. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day.